What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is May 29th of 2018. Well folks, today I want to spend some time to talk about a topic that I know has brought about a tad bit of controversy for some people. For those of you out there who follow me on Twitter, you might have seen my recent tweet where I gave my price prediction for Bitcoin. So I want to spend some time today to talk about why I stand by my prediction. But before we dive into the price tied to my prediction, as well as the fundamentals that have led me to believe that we can reach this price by the end of 2018, I want to make a few things clear, guys. Look, not only is this just a prediction, it's just simply my opinion. I've gone through, I've analyzed the fundamentals, not only of crypto markets, but traditional markets that have led me to where I stand. So because of that, it is just my opinion and do not take it as financial advice. I have no guarantee that we're going to reach this price, but I do believe that it is much more probable that we reach this price rather than not. And because of that, I'm going to stand by my convictions. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. The majority of my money is in crypto. And I'm going to share with you all today as to why I believe Bitcoin could reach $50,000 by the end of this year. So we've got six months to go. How could we reach that in such a bearish market, a low liquidity, a low volume market where it just seems like there's so much negativity? Well, a lot of it doesn't have to do with crypto markets. I think the fundamentals are extremely sound. We've already been seeing a lot of developments come in in regards to the OTC market as well as the ICO space. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming. But speaking about Bitcoin here. I want to talk a little bit about how some of the traditional market fundamentals are causing a scenario where we could possibly see Bitcoin spike over the next few months. Now, going on ahead, you know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I want to spend some time as well. The reason why I'm addressing this, guys, is because there's been a few articles coming out talking about this tweet that I put out. I never would have thought that it would have gotten as big as it did and as many people would, you know, to, to think that people would even care about it. But I am going to stand by my convictions and I'll explain why I believe this. So let's let's go ahead and talk a little bit on the surface level about what I stated in my tweet and then go through some extra fundamentals that I wasn't able to share because tweets are limited to a specific amount of characters and I can't share all my sources and reasons as to why I stand the way I do. So the claim is $50,000. Why do I stand this way? Well, first off, I mentioned that interest rates will continue to rise. So when I'm talking about interest rates, I'm talking about traditional markets. And you'll see that that's the big focus in my, my tweet here and my claim and, and how I believe Bitcoin is going to reach $50,000. Interest rates are continuing to rise, whether it be uh, the, central bank, uh, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, or the European Central Bank. Other global central banks are starting to rise their rates. And this is going to set a tightening on the economy. It gets more expensive to borrow money. And because of this, I think you're going to see a few different things. You're going to possibly see, again, this is more of one of the wider claims, but I believe that Deutsche Bank, uh, one of the major global banks in the European Union, a massive German bank, is going to possibly go under or face economic turmoil going into the later part of 2018. We'll talk a little bit about this later on and why I believe that. Along with that as well, equities and housing prices, I believe, will take a massive hit. We've talked about in the past, and if you haven't seen it, I'll leave it linked down below and you should watch it after this video, the massive asset bubble that has been built up not only in the U.S. but across global markets due to quantitative easing as well as artificially low interest rates, which we will spend some time to talk about. But because of all of this, because of these economic standards, we are going to reach a moment where there are trillions of dollars that need to exit equities markets, need to exit out stocks, exit out of uh, other different asset classes like housing. Uh, we have artificially high prices in these different types of assets, and they need to move out and find a way to uh, you know, hold a sense of value. In most cases, people don't want it to just be cash because if the base dollar around it is losing value, they want to be in something that's speculative, something such as gold, silver, precious metals that hold a store of value, other different commodities. Or in this case, what I believe is going to happen is that not only has there been financial pressure for this to be pushed this year because people want to get a piece of the action, but it is seen as a hedge, in my opinion, to have a Bitcoin ETF. Okay, We've been talking about this on the channel a lot, how Bitcoin could serve as a, a, a sense of a hedge against the traditional financial system. Without any central bank, without any reckless monetary policy, Bitcoin holds as a sense, uh, not so much as a store of value, but as an opportunity to hedge against these traditional institutions of finance. That's my major statement here. And this is why I think we're going to see Bitcoin at 50,000. So anyways, let's go ahead and talk about some of these fundamentals here. What does it mean when I'm claiming Bitcoin could reach 50,000? It means that Bitcoin would hold a market cap valuation, which again, isn't always a steady way to value things, but it would hold a market capitalization due to uh, the supply of Bitcoin matched with the price uh, a little bit above $800 billion. Okay. Now, this does sound relatively high from where we are now, but we've seen Bitcoin not only above $300 billion in the past, but again, if 
all these fundamentals that we factor in go into place, it would not be that crazy to think that Bitcoin could have a market cap of that price. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these things. So I talked about Deutsche Bank in my tweet. Now, it is important to note that Deutsche Bank is one of the worst positioned banks in the EU right now in regards to the size of Deutsche Bank and then also uh, the, its fundamentals, its financials, and where it's currently standing in regards to uh, its, its sovereignty as a bank. You know, Can it stand in this economic environment that's starting to get more tightening, starting to get a little bit more difficult with rising interest rates? Well. We can already see there's a lot of visual signs here. Not only has Deutsche Bank gone through and cutting 7,000 employees off uh, off the payroll, there's there's about I think 70, I think it was 79 or 77,000 employees originally, and now they've announced by the end of the year they're going to have to cut off a massive chunk of their labor force behind the company. Now most of this is going to be in the trading uh, and commodities division, and this shows that. There's a lot less anticipation probably for trading in equities markets, but I think in general that it shows a sign that this restructuring that they're going through at the moment, that's what they label it as, is where they're having to start to make cuts because they're going to realize, as they're starting to now, that the economy is getting more difficult to lend out to. And we can see across the board here, there's other things. Not only uh, have these cuts come in, but with the announcement of the cuts, they've reflected that in second quarter results that there would be a revenue environment that remains challenging, okay? Now, why is it that revenue is going to be more difficult for banks? Why is it that the lending environment is going to be more difficult? Well, it's because of the fact of LIBOR rates increasing, okay? So LIBOR rates, as well as the, the federal funds rate, I don't mean to swamp you guys with too much information here, but I'm trying to kind of summarize and give you a good bold picture. The fact of the matter is LIBOR rates are generally the rate at which it's going to cost uh, to uh, borrow money, the interest rate. So for example, uh, if what we take a look at here in the LIBOR rates, we've seen that LIBOR rates have been well below 1% for about six years up until 2015. We had a nice period where interest rates were practically either 0% or around 1%, pretty much meaning that money was pretty much free to borrow. You could go out and borrow tons of monies and go buy stock or you could buy a house or you could do whatever. You know, money was very cheap for the past few years. And because of that, people took a lot of risky positions where they, as the central banks across the world thought this money was going to be lent out. A lot of it went in to propping up assets and propping up things that are real, not investing in the real economy. And now those interest rates for the 12 month, six month, three month, and one month are starting to rise exponentially. The European Central Bank has cut out quantitative easing. They've stopped injecting new capital and removal of toxic assets out of the economy and have started to flush in new higher levels of interest rates, setting a tightening on the economy, setting higher standards, and expecting that the economy is going to be able to hold when these rates come up, that banks like Deutsche Bank will still be able to make good revenue lending out. However, we have seen, even as the European Central Bank starts to rise these rates, that Deutsche Bank, I'm not the only one who believes this, the Deutsche Bank holds one of the greatest risks to the global financial system. And this is a quote from the IMF. Other central banks across the world, the Federal Reserve, have been showing a risk factor, as well as the BIS, have been showing risk factors for Deutsche Bank over the past few months. And we can see here that this is also followed by other European banks, HSBC as well as, as, well as Credit Suisse. So we can see here that there is a lot of worry in regards to European stance. And it's a matter right now as we start to see these rising interest rates, these you know higher standards for banks uh, in regards to a, a growing economy, supposedly, uh, that we are setting a, a very, very big level of concern for where Europe's economy is right now. Can it continue to lend at the rates that it's lending right now with these higher interest rates? Have we actually seen fundamental economic growth? And with that, it is going to put a strain on these banks. So if the case is that Deutsche Bank cannot hold well is looking for a tightening level of revenue with these growing economic standards, we can expect that there's a chance that this restructuring will not be enough, that it could face some serious pain. And I always tell people, it's, it's always good to look at fundamentals, to look at the financials of companies. That's probably the best thing you can do. But another great thing you can do, and this is where really money talks, is the price of the asset. And we can see here that Deutsche Bank is, has not only since 2015, or sorry, excuse me, 2016, been below 2008 levels. We have now seen over the past three to five months a general drop in the price. It's Sorry, I'd say about four or five months where Deutsche Bank has lost practically half of its equity value. The company has been cut in half in value over the past few months and is practically on free fall right now. So because of this, we have to be concerned here. 
we have to be concerned in regards to this type of price action. And it sends signals that there is some serious weakness in regards to this. Now, to, to show a little bit of a flash here, I want to spend some time here. Again, you guys know I don't always take the opinion of Soros that strong. But Soros has been talking uh, about a European crisis over the past few months. Uh, actually, not the past few months. Past two years he's been talking about this. And he's been really hitting the nail on the head in regards to what's going on right now. There is a massive crisis in the EU at the moment. Both politically, I think he brings up some, some decent points. I don't really agree with all of them. But he does hit the nail on the head in regards to the fact that there is a crisis in Europe right now with different uh, political issues as well as financial issues. The Italian economy, as we're going to talk about here in just a moment, is really going to be one of those milestones. But as you can see today as well, that not only with the fears, I think, of Deutsche Bank, but also what's growing in Italy, which we're going to talk about now, that U.S. equities are starting to take a dip. This is the Dow Jones. You can take a look at the S&P 500 that is broken back through below the wedge, as well as the triple Qs. The Nasdaq has started to roll over here as well. So let's go ahead and talk about what's going on in Italy, because this is something that takes up a little bit more of my concern here that I didn't get to mention on the tweet. Long story short, if you guys want to learn about the kind of political turmoil that's going down in the EU, I recommend you all watch Monaco 64. He's a really cool contrarian economist. He gives really good perspective and talks in regards to what's going on and a variety of different issues and uh, the kind of conflicts that are going on right now between the banking cartel of the world, the BIS, the IMF, the World Bank, comparative to countries like Italy. But Generally speaking right now, Italy has been going through a very big tightening issue right now. And that's the fact that its yields right now, the yields on its government bonds are spiking at the moment. So when yields are spiking on a bond, it's generally showing that that country is at risk. The bonds are more risky in that sense. If you're obviously getting paid a higher interest rate for holding bonds, it might sound great on paper, but what it means is that not many people really want to buy your bonds. So if these bonds are representing the debt of the Italian government, this is showing that across the board, we have seen not only the biggest spike we've seen in a practical time over the past year, but we are seeing the highest yield rate we've seen on Italian bonds since all the way back in 2014. This, this political issue has been brewing for a while. Many people have been talking about this, but it's just finally starting to get reflected in regards to price action here in the Italian bonds. And Another thing to point out as well is that the only buyer of Italian bonds really over the past few years has been the European Central Bank. We talked about this actually back in my previous video, which I again recommend you go check out, where we talked about in Japan, the only buyer, the true buyer of the ETFs in their economy has been generally the Japanese Central Bank. And in this case, we can see that really one of the only buyers right here indicated here in the dark blue color is the Central Bank, the European Central Bank. And the people who've been exiting are residents, non-residents, other financial institutions, banks, etc. They're all getting out. They're not buying the bonds. So this is a very, very important reflection of the fact that the Italian government, one of the, the countries that many refer to in the analogy pigs, Portugal, uh, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. We've already seen Greece take the hit. Could Italy be the next domino? And with Greece never really recovering, and with Italy taking a hit, this could leave some serious issues for the EU. We've already been seeing Brexit happen, and within regards to the UK, we've seen Greece in political ter uh, economic turmoil defaulting to a very high uh, level in regards to a lot of the, the, the debt that it was living on, as well as Italy as well. There hasn't been an economic recovery in the fundamentals. And you can see this again reflected in the price of equities across the market. You can see in Tesa San Paolo, one of the largest banks in Italy, flash crashing over the past three weeks, cutting off almost a third of its value. We can take a look here at Banco BPM. Again, over the past four weeks, almost slashing a third of its value off. So We've seen that there's a crisis across the board in the EU, and I think this is where we're going to start seeing some of the dominoes hit. It might not be in the US, but I think the US, as we've been taking a look at earlier, um, as we get the right chart here, there we go. Uh, as we get the right chart, we can see that equities markets have been generally bad across the board in the US as well. But again, as we've gone through these here, guys, there's there's gotta be some given time here. We have to see if this is gonna be a catalyst for it. Again, I don't wanna make a claim that this is gonna be it. And I'm not gonna say it's happening next week. I'm not gonna say that it's happening over the next month. I'm not someone who tries to really uh, time when this is happening, but I have a general time horizon where I think this could be very much uh, plausible to happen. We've been through a massive 10 year bull cycle in most markets. And when we look at indexes like this, this is another good chart that I saw recently that I thought I should share with you all. 
This is a chart uh, comparing a ratio between uh, a major commodity index comparative to the S&P 500. And basically speaking, uh, when the uh, ratio is high, when we see it in these ranges like eight to nine, it's showing that the entire commodities index is outweighing the S&P 500 at an eight to nine ratio. But we are looking at now, uh, down at this level here in 2017 and 2018, that the commodity to S&P 500 ratio is at a level unseen since uh, for 50 years, for 50 years, practically speaking. Now, what does this mean? Well, when we take a look at this, if we take a good hard look at this chart here, this ratio, when have we seen it at fresh lows? When have we seen commodities cheap uh, and pretty much on an even plane, a one-to-one -one ratio with the S&P 500? Well, we've seen that right at the peak of the dot-com era. And we've seen that in 1987. Again, these are moments when markets were peaking out and had dramatic declines afterwards in regards to asset prices. So again, the indexes uh, across the board are starting, starting to show signs of weakness. But the only thing that isn't showing a sign of weakness and that is looking like it wants to go up are commodities at the moment. We can see that gold is holding very well in this ascending triangle right here. We know that an ascending triangle is a bullish trend. We can see in silver, for example, silver has been building a wedge up since 2016, much like how gold is building up its ascending triangle. And this is either looking for a very dramatic breakdown or a breakup. I would say that it's looking for a breakup in regards to its historical price action. So we see this across the board. We see that commodities are one of the only safe havens. And you can take a look at things like uranium. I've talked about a few of these different markets in the past, and now they're all showing signs of serious breakouts. But I want to talk in regards to my major point. All of this is going to lead towards not only uh, not only US stocks, people leaving these major indexes in a variety of different US companies, leaving out of bonds and different types of markets in regards to the European, uh, the European banks and the European governments, but we need to talk about where all this money is going to go. A lot of it is going to flow into commodities, I believe. I think we're going to get a massive resurgence in commodities, whereas people have been gotten tired of all the stagnation in commodities and the decline we've seen over the past few years since many people had started buying them. We are going to not only see a rise in commodities, but we're going to see a new uh, currency, commodity-based market, a digital currency and commodity-based market arise over the next few months. And Wall Street's getting ready for it. The SEC has reopened the doors. Many people still don't consider how important this is. The SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, has gone about reopening the doors to a discussion on a Bitcoin ETF. And I can't stress to you all enough how important this is because this is going to give a variety of different forms of institution, uh, institutions and finance the ability not only to invest in Bitcoin, but to get mass retail adoption into Bitcoin that isn't able to set up a Coinbase account, that doesn't know how to go through the complex process of entering capital into these markets right now. We need to talk about how massive this is because this is an entirely new emerging market right now. And it's coming in at a perfect time where there's global, uh, global economic instability from all the things we talked about in regards to the asset bubble and what's going on in the EU right now. So because of this and the fact that you see organizations like the Chicago Board um, Options Exchange coming out in support of something like this. This is extremely exciting. And I think, again, we always have to go back and see what ETFs have done for other different types of assets. The biggest example is gold. We can see that when GLD, the common gold ETF, we actually just took a look at it earlier, when the gold ETF was created, we saw gold continue to rise on an unprecedented rise for an already well-formed commodities market, an already multi uh, you know, it was, I think it was already a trillion dollar market at the time, but we were able to rise it to where it is now. I think it's a six trillion dollar market in valuation. So this goes to show that ETFs can bring about a larger rise because it opens up the gates of investment for other people to get into these markets. And it happened in gold in an unprecedented time period. But we're talking about Bitcoin, which is still sitting at around 120 billion dollar valuation, where Practically, the only people invested are either people who have been mining a ton of it over the past few years or people who have gone out and bought retail size purchases. Few institutions, few hedge funds have bought in. They've been mostly dabbling in ICOs and all these different other speculative currencies. But the point drills home to this, guys. We are at a moment, even though it seems so bearish, even though it seems so gloomy, and even though it seems very illiquid at the moment, we don't have a lot of people trading Bitcoin. 
that over the next six months, I think we are going to see something unprecedented that we can't explain. We are going to see the 10-year credit cycle turn over. Credit is not cheap anymore. Money is not easy to borrow. And because of that, we're really going to test the global economy and see where things can go over the next few months. Can it sustain at these levels? And we already know organizations like the Federal Reserve have to see two periods of decline in the economy before they really take any serious measures of calling something a recession. So it'll really depend as to whether or not we're going to see positive price action in traditional markets. And I don't think we're going to see a continuation. I think we're going to see a massive decline. And when the game's up, when we realize the game's rigged, SEC is going to be very, very quick to respond in providing alternative solutions to investment. And I think you're going to see a Bitcoin ETF by the end of this year. So I'm standing by my words. Who knows? I could be wrong, guys. I could be completely off track, but this is where I'm going to stand. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, believe in this, and I know that cryptocurrencies, even if not by 2018, we are going to see Bitcoin probably amongst 50,000 and much higher levels in the future because there is an entire new renaissance in finance with cryptocurrencies. It is something we've never seen before. It is something that is challenging and cannot be shut down and will not go away. It will not go away. Traditional finance is going to have to adapt. And I think the first stance they're going to do that is through a financial product that could bring them a lot of trading, re trading revenues when we're seeing a depletion in traditional market trading revenues. Well, anyways, that's it for the video, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope I made my points clear. I hope my tweet makes a little bit more sense now. But again, it's just my opinion. I'd like to hear what you all think down in the comments down below. Let's get a discussion going between one another and hear some facts, some evidence behind those points and get a very nice kind of discussion going so we can hear about different approaches and different opinions on this topic. Anyways, guys, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.